and welcome to another video from DFS on technology. In this video, I'm going to talk about the backup strategies I use for my various Raspberry Pi machines. I have a number of Raspberry Pis similar to this one. This is a Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gigs of memory. And uh, my most important Raspberry Pi runs my email server, so SMTP and IMAP. It runs my asterisk phone system, and it also runs my OpenVPN endpoint. So this is a pretty important machine to back up. There are a number of strategies we can use to back up a Raspberry Pi. We could simply rsync all the files over to another machine, and that's fine. But since the Raspberry Pi uses a, a micro SD card to hold the OS and all the files, it would be pretty handy to have a backup that's an SD card image so that in case the SD card fails, we can just write the image to a new SD card, put it in the Pi and be ready to go. The problem with using an image as a backup is that dumping the SD card image to a disk is rather slow. It takes 25 minutes for my computer to read this 32 gigabyte SD card over USB and dump it to a file image. So this means that you have to have 25 minutes of downtime every time you want to update the image. The problem with using rsync, of course, is that you have to reinstall the OS and then rsync the files over and hope you didn't miss anything. It's awkward. Wouldn't it be perfect if we could have a way to make a base image and then keep it updated every day so your image is always within a day or so of current? Well, you can. I'm going to talk about ways you can do this on Linux. We have here a Pi 4. And in order to make a backup image of the SD card, we just take the SD card out of the Pi. So that's the SD card. And then I have a small USB adapter that fits the SD card like this, like this, and then I can plug this into any PC to read the SD card. This is my main workstation, so we plug the USB adapter with the SD card in it right here, and then we use the Linux DD command to extract the contents of the SD card into a file. So first of all, to figure out what the device of the uh, USB SD card reader is, I'm going to just take a quick look at the SD devices because it shows up as a disk. And you can see here it's SDI, that's the last SCSI disk that was attached. So to dump the contents to a file, you just use the dd command input file equals dev SDI, output file equals pi dot image. I'll use a block size of one megabyte and I'll ask for progress because this could take a while. It's a 32 gigabyte SD card and off we go. Oh, I guess I need to do this as root. And there we have it. After about uh, 1528 seconds, which is about 25 and a half minutes, we have dumped the entire SD card into a file on the file system, which is right there, pi.image. What exactly is in this pi.image file that we have here? Well, it's just a dump of the d disk device itself, so we can run fdisk on it. And if we take a look, there's a partition table there. There are two partitions on the drive, or on the SD card image. The first is a small uh, 256 megabyte FAT32 partition. That's used for the boot partition in the Pi. I'm not going to worry too much about that. Um, but we also have a much larger 28.7 gigabyte 
Linux ext4 file system, and this is the root file system of the Raspberry Pi. Now we can actually mount a file as if it were a disk using the loop device. This is a built-in device driver in Linux that lets you treat a file as a block device. So I'm going to go ahead and mount this root file system on my computer. Now I have to take a look at where it starts because the loop device is going to need to know the offset into the file at which the file system begins. So the start position is, fifth, is this, 532,480, and the unit is blocks. So each, each one of those blocks is 512 bytes. The loop device wants an actual byte offset, so we have to multiply those two numbers together. The answer that we get is this large number here. So I'm going to go ahead and mount it, and if we look in slash pi, we have what looks like probably a Raspberry Pi file system. Uh, now let's see how much of that file system is actually in use. Not a whole lot. There's only three gigabytes used. So is there any way that we can have an image that doesn't take up all of that disk space? There is, because Linux has a feature called sparse files, which I'll describe next. Now I'm going to demonstrate this with a little C program. Let me just copy it. I'm going to take a look at the C program to see what it does. This is not a good C program, by the way. It doesn't have any error checking. It's purely for educational purposes and illustration. So let's take a look at the main function. The first thing we do is declare an integer variable called fd, which stands for file descriptor. Because in the original Unix IO model, a file descriptor was just an integer. So here, we're opening a file called test file. We're opening it for write only, and we're also going to create the file if it doesn't exist. We're going to write a single character at the beginning of the file, which is just the letter X. We're then going to move the write pointer 1 billion bytes, or 1, one gigabyte, further ahead in the file and we're going to write another single X in the file and we're going to close it. So let me compile this program. So we have our image, we have sparse and the C source code, and now if I run sparse, you can see that it created a, a file that's about 1.1 gigabytes long. It's actually one gigabyte plus a byte. So that's a very large file, but how much disk space does it use? Eight kilobytes. So what's going on here? We have a one gigabyte plus file that's only using eight kilobytes of disk space. And what's going on here is that if there's a long run of zeros in a file, if you create it using the method I used in Sparse where you just seek, the Unix file system doesn't actually store all of those zeros. It just stores a little bit of bookkeeping so that it knows all the zeros are supposed to be there. If you read the file in, you'll get the letter X, you'll get a gigabyte of zeros almost, and then another letter X. Now the problem is when you create a file system on an SD card, the unused blocks do not necessarily contain zeros, they just contain whatever happened to be in the flash memory when the file system was created. And actually that's often all ones because an unwritten sort of erased flash block contains all ones typically. So we need a way to zero out the unused blocks in the file systems. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in the next segment. There is a program called ZeroFree that zeroes out all of the unused blocks in an ext2, ext3, or ext4 file system. But ZeroFree wants a block device. It can't be used on a file itself. So we have to manually set up the loop device, which I'm going to do with this command right here. 
what it did is it found the first available loop device. It printed the name on the file on, on standard output. This is our file. That's the underlying file behind the, the loop device. And this is the offset at which we want our file system to begin. And I can now zero out the file system by typing zero free minus v dev loop zero. And zero free happily believes that dev loop zero is an actual block device. It doesn't know that underlying it is a file. So we'll just let that run. And there we go. Now I will take down the loop device. This essentially removes the association between pi.image and the dev loop zero device. Let's see how much disk space our image takes now. What? It still takes 29 gigabytes of disk space. Well, the thing is, merely writing zeros to a file doesn't make it sparse. In order to make a file sparse, you need to use that seek trick where you seek past the end of the file and then continue writing. So wouldn't it be nice if there were a way to read in the file with all the zeros, but instead of writing runs of zeros, just convert them to seeks? Well, there is a way to do it. There are actually several ways, but the way I like to do it is with rsync. rsync has a sparse option that tries to make long runs of zero into sparse files. So let's kick that command off. It'll take uh, three minutes or so. And there we go. So let us see how long those two files are. They're both exactly the same length, 31 billion and some odd bytes long. But if we look at the disk space, the sparse version uses a tenth of the disk space of the full version. And yet if you read the sparse version in the entire thing, you'll get exactly the same answer as if you read the regular version in. All of those long runs of zeros are still there. They're just not stored on disk. The file system is smart enough to just store bookkeeping information. So there you go. We've stored 29 gigabytes of data in 2.9 gigabytes of disk space. If you copy the sparse file around, in other words, if you make backups of the backup, you have to be careful to preserve the sparseness. So you need to use options for rsync or cp if you're using cp to preserve the sparseness, but that's not too hard. Well, that's great. We went to all that trouble to make a sparse image, but how do we keep our image up to date without suffering any downtime on the Raspberry Pi? The answer is pretty simple. Once a day or once an hour, whatever schedule you pick, you mount the image using the loopback device to some place in your file system. You rsync the files over from the Raspberry Pi to that mounted file system, and then you unmount it. Under the hood, the disk image stored on your computer will be updated so that it's up to date with the disk image of the Raspberry Pi at the time you did the rsync. Obviously, if files are changing while you're doing rsyncing, there could be a little bit of skew, but it'll be as good as just a regular file rsync. And you can back up your disk image using normal file transfer and file backup tools. So you can have, for example, an offsite backup of your Raspberry Pi that transfers very efficiently over the network because it's sparse and you can use rsync. Anyway, that's it for this video. I hope you've found it useful. I hope you back up your important systems at least daily. I hope that you test that your backups work and I'll talk to you again next time.